radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black. <laughs> Bespoke radio for the masses. Uh, yeah, today's Monday, February 21st, 2022. 52 days into the new year, only 314 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of nowhere. But it's a total undisclosed location. But it's beautiful. It is. How you doing? How you doing? I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer, and Unex Networks. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How are you doing? All right. You know what? We have an amazing week. I just just came off a pretty crazy weekend and a, a little bit about that too as well. Um, how do I put it? I, um, I got really wrapped up. Tonight, Kathleen Martin joins us. And she is here tonight to announce the release of her new book. It is called Forbidden Knowledge. I'll get to that in in just a second. But tomorrow night, Freddie Silva is back with us. And uh, tomorrow night, we're going to be discussing uh, a few different subjects, but mainly this, all under the umbrella of ET contact in deep, ancient, far ancient history. And what are the concepts behind this? And uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation tomorrow night. Freddie, one of the uh, most brightest uh, uh, and educated researchers, especially when we go into deep history uh, with cultures all around the world. um, And he's been able to dedicate his life into the deep dive uh, culturally uh, on every continent. It's uh, it's amazing his his vast knowledge and I had a uh, a great opportunity to hang out with Freddie this weekend and I I just I I I just had to get him on the show and that's it it was one of those things where I wasn't gonna no we need to continue this conversation that we're having now I want to share this with everybody so we're gonna get right back to it tomorrow night with Freddie Silva. And then Wednesday night, John Greenwald is here now. Uh, and uh, you saw the title of that, you know, Keeping It Real, John Greenwald. And last week with uh, Lou Elizondo on the show, the this NSA document uh, was revealed on the show, which I had not heard about at that time. And uh, I have since then... I've got a copy of it. Oh, I don't have it here. Uh, I've read through it a few times. And then this 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 went this went pretty pretty viral throughout the UFO community. So much so 
that I got a couple of pretty incredible emails um, from some lofty individuals out there uh, bringing this up. And I thought, man, really? What is going on? Now, um, that's what we're going to discuss Wednesday. Not only the content of this NSA report uh, that is available at uh, NSA.gov. This isn't some document that we have to wonder about the provenance on or or who what. No, this is an NSA document for sure. What is it, the meaning behind it and all of that? And, and why should the UFO community care? And what's the uproar about? Um, and I think the uproar is about there's there's two words that you can use. You can use interpretation and you can use interpolation. If you don't understand the differences between those words, look it up and uh, we'll discuss more of that on, thir- on on Wednesday night. But man, man, man. And, and I got to tell you, John reached out to me, uh, Greenwald, and said, what's up, man? <laughs> I said, okay, you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Love you, man. I said, I love you back. Literally. That was in the text, too, by the way. Um, So, yeah, first opportunity out of the gate is Wednesday night. And John Greenwald is back with us. So what an amazing week here on Fade to Black. Now, Thursday's another fader night with open lines all night long. And uh, now, okay, I got to get to a couple of more points. Uh, follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. Hello to everybody out there listening and watching all around the world. Okay. Now, back to what I started to say, which is this. Kathleen Martin and, and the new book. A couple of strange things uh, happened with this book. and And so I'm wrapped up reading it today. And I want to say really quick uh, to Renee, who Renee has worked all weekend long. Um, I, I was I was gone uh, working. I didn't tell anybody that I was leaving on this trip, but uh, you know I, I'm doing things all the time. I don't have to share everything that I'm doing with you, do I? Right. So anyway, so I was I was and Renee. I mean, Renee is one of the hardest where she does not take her foot off the gas. And we are blessed to have her as a producer here at, at Fade to Black. And I thank, thank the heavens above every day for Renee. But anyway, she's working all weekend long and and all of these great topics. To, it, to, and, and, and I was so happy about all of that. But Kathleen Martin comes along and sends me this book. And I I got so wrapped up into it. And I couldn't stop. And I'm I'm finding myself instead of, you know, just reading the book and, and getting it done, that I'm going back and I'm reading chapters over and I'm stopping. I'm reading paragraphs twice and three times and going back and what 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 is going on here? What, what's happening? And I got sucked up into it. And it got to the point where um, I I continued to read until showtime tonight, until it's 10 after 7. Right now, show started at 7. I stopped reading the book at 6.56. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is... An astonishingly well written book, but it's what is in the book, and it's just incredible. So, and and this is what happened. I went back and went. I didn't do any of Renee's news. I didn't go back all day today. I didn't go back. And I forgot about fade to black. I forgot about it. I it just all completely got away from me. And uh, so 
with that, tomorrow I've got a lot of news to cover. <laughs> I, I it just it's what happened today with Kathleen, and and this is uh, back to the point with Renee. Renee sends me this email today about Kathleen, and what Renee wrote in the email got me more sidetracked off of what I was supposed to do today. And, and and only Renee knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so it's partially Renee's fault. So anyway, that's that's how great this book is. And uh and I and and I truly mean it. And and I went back and, and spoke to Kathleen about this. I said, Wow, wow, you really put it all in this book. Okay, so we'll talk to Kathleen about that. In, in, in just a bit, she'll be with us at the bottom of the hour. For now, let's kind of steer back and getting this show back on track. I'm very excited about this book. Uh, it is released today on Amazon. Kathleen is here with us in celebration uh, for the premiere and the release of her new book. Okay? All right. Let's get this show cracking. Happy birthday to today, Kumail. Nanjiani today is 43. We know him from Silicon Valley. Very funny guy. Justin Roiland today. Who's Justin Roiland, Jimmy? I'm, wait, wait, who is Justin Roiland? Well, first off, he's 41 years old. Justin Roiland is the creator of Rick and Morty. That's right. <laughs> he's the voices of Rick and Morty, by the way. And how they get those conversations going back and forth. How do they do that? Go watch a couple of documentaries with Justin and in interviews. It's incredible. Justin Roiland, creator of Rick and Morty today, is 41 years old. Our dead guy's birthday today, Alan Rickman, 1946 to 2016. Yeah, had to take a moment. Alan's first film. Alan's not only first film, first film role was Hans Gruber in Die Hard. Came out of the gate with that. Next, he was the sheriff of Nottingham in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And everything after cemented him as one of the great actors of a generation. Alexander Dane in Galaxy Quest. Metatron in Dogma. Severus Snape in the Harry Potter series. Marvin, the paranoid android in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And Judge Turpin in Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. Incredible. In August 2015, he suffered a minor stroke which led to the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. He died just six months later in London on January 14th, 2016. Happy birthday, Alan. On this day in history, 1965, in New York City, Malcolm X is assassinated while addressing his organization of Afro-American unity at the Audubon Ballroom. He was just 39 years old. Here's your fader fact. The village. Okay. okay. <laughs> Louisiana in the house. The village of waterproof Louisiana sits two and a half miles from its original 1830s location, having been moved three times due to floodwaters. And that. That is your fader fact. Tonight, very special guest, Kathleen Martin, joins us. She's here to announce the release of her new book. It is called Forbidden Knowledge. The link's for it, KathleenMartin.com. It is available right now on Amazon. This is a must-read for the entire UFO community and the rest of the world. Tomorrow night, Freddie Silva is back. Freddie Silva is back with us. So, Freddie... Uh, I'm with him uh, uh, over the weekend. Freddie gets out of uh, a car. He's been picked up. He's been dropped off. We're at the the set, uh, the film, the film shoot, 
gets out of the car, looks over. Jimmy Church. I said, hey, what's going on? Where's my strat? I said, Freddie, it's good to see you too. Yeah, I know. But before we start talking, man, uh, you never mailed me my guitar you were going to send. I said, Freddie, Freddie, Freddie. <laughs> It was just amazing hanging out with him this weekend. And we're going to continue our conversation tomorrow night right here on the show. Then Wednesday night, John Greenwald is here. We're going to be talking about that NSA report that is available at NSA.gov. Thursday is another fader night with open lines all night long. All right. All right. Now I'm going to hit this River Moon coffee because... Well, because I need it. I had an amazing weekend, and uh, I literally flew out Friday night and flew back early yesterday morning. I'm on a plane at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., something like that, and uh, trying to get back uh, to L.A. Um, at a reasonable time, which was, you know, 2 in the afternoon, which is pretty good, uh, because I had work to do. So that's... That's what I did. And so I wrapped. I didn't tell anybody. This is what I did. I wrapped on the show Thursday night. Three hours sleep. That's it. Boom. Out of here. Uh, turned around. I Literally shot all day <clears throat> on Saturday. And uh, turned around, got on a plane, and right back here. And I have not stopped. And there's only one way that that happened. River Moon Coffee. <sighs> Rivermoonwellness.com. All right. So, <clears throat> so I had this a crazy, amazing weekend. Sonia Grace, right? Roderick Martin, you know, Billy Carson, and uh, Elizabeth uh, Hoekstra. Um, and Nikki Speaks, it was uh, uh, Melissa Tittle, and her friend who I met, who is a frigging Air National Guard pilot. That's a whole other story. I can't discuss that on the air, but that that was pretty crazy. Um, just um, uh, just an amazing weekend. Sonia's husband, Sean, and uh, the power. Uh, that was a lot of uh, a lot of strong knowledge all at the same place at the same time. So after going through a weekend like that. Um, I jump on the plane. I fly back to L.A. And this is what happens. You know, um, I had said this was yesterday. Today's Monday, folks. So a couple of weeks ago, I had talked about on this program what it, what it would be like one day if something just appeared in the skies above Los Angeles. You know, just some crazy thing, you know, and how I and the and the rest of the world would react, right? Well, yesterday, after um, I arrive back, I leave LAX, get off the plane, leave LAX. I'm in the Jeep, and I'm driving up the 405 freeway, and... In that section of the freeway between like the 105, you know, I just passed the 105 freeway, I should say. And, you know, you're like in between Culver City and Santa Monica and LAX is on your left and, and the Pacific Ocean is out to your left. And in front of you is the mountains and the 405 is going to head up over the mountains, right? Okay, so that's where I'm at. I'm heading north and uh, something catches my eye like off here. I'm driving this way and something just like... There's mountains over here and, and things, but it's off in the distance. But I could see it. It's to my left, something, you know, in the sky. And it's in the clouds above the mountains, you know, right there behind Santa Monica. Now, remember, I'm driving in traffic in Los Angeles. I got to keep my eyes on the road, right? I got to drive. But something was so big that it caught me. And I looked and and I see it. I was like, What? And uh, uh, I got to keep up, you know, but something has caught my attention. And then trees and buildings are coming by and they kind of block my view for a second. Again, I'm driving. But I did notice 
that the clouds, as I'm trying to, you know, take another quick glance back, the clouds are white in the area where this thing was. And from that distance, whatever it was, was big, but I couldn't see, you know, and then, then it hits me all at once. Was this something finally appearing in the skies? Is this the big one, right? Like for real. And I had like this adrenaline rush because I'm telling you, I saw something and it was real and it was going through the clouds and it was so big that the clouds were like wrapping around it. It's like right out of Arrival or Independence Day or something. And uh, I'm tripping. And so I look back again, the first chance that I got because I'm driving and there it was. And this time I'm a little bit closer because I've driven a couple of miles up the freeway. I'm driving north. And yes, there is something big moving in and out of the clouds. So I decide to do a live stream on Facebook while driving. Never try this yourself, but remember, I am a professional. So I just start I just start streaming. I'm like, you know, and I'm driving, you know, and I fire up the live stream and I'm trying to stay in my lane. I fire up the thing and, you know, boom. And I just start live streaming right out the window, man. I'm just like, you know, roll down the window. And uh, I'm streaming from the driver's seat at speed on the 405. And... As I looked at it to my left, and I, I'm just I'm just live streaming. I'm not looking at the live stream to see what's being recorded. I'm not interested in any of that. I just know the general direction where it is, and I've got this live streaming happening out the window. And 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 I'm looking. And I'm trying to describe what is going on. And one thing is for sure, as as I take a look, it's an airship. It is. For me, it just didn't have that classic like Goodyear blimp shape to it where the gondola is in the middle and, you know, the Goodyear blimp. Didn't have that. There was a couple of humps on the front of it and the back wings to me looked bigger. And my first thought that it was a new rigid airship, you know, the the new one that was in the news a few years back for commercial passenger use. And maybe it was out flight testing over L.A., you know. and Okay, cool. That's pretty cool. I, I know now it's not an alien invasion. Now, I was over that excitement pretty quickly, but I got to say, this was something I've never seen before. Now, uh, when I finally got home, I checked out the 20 or so pics that I tried to take while driving, and I did that. I ended the live stream, and I was literally just out the window holding I'm driving. I'm just like click, 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 and as many pictures as I could, and... and uh, I went back and looked, and then I saw what was posted on Facebook. And uh, it was the Goodyear blimp over the golf tournament in in Santa Monica. So, okay. Now, all of this led me into checking out the new Goodyear blimp because, you know, sure, what I saw was probably the blimp, and no problem there, but, but from what I saw with my own eyes and what I caught in the images in the video clearly shows a hump on the top, on the front, and and the shape was long. It was long. It wasn't like the Goodyear blimp shape. It was long with this, you know. So everything I found online doesn't show this hump. Now, I'm not saying that this is some great conspiracy. Far from it. I'm just saying that what I saw was not in any images for the new blimp that I found online. My eyes saw a hump or two. So I grabbed a couple of the clearer images that I had not looked at it in some software, blew it up. And there it was. The hump that I saw with my eyes was just a reflection from the sun. From a distance... With the naked eye, I saw something completely different. That's right. To anyone who was watching the live stream or the video that is still online would have seen the same thing. 
That's right. And and I saw the comments from everybody. Now, the, the Goodyear blimp picture is posted later, but every I saw the comments. No, that's 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 something different. You got something because of the way that the sun and the shot and the distance and the way the cloud went and everything else, it just didn't have that Goodyear blimp shape. It was long with a couple of humps on the top. It was it was bizarre. It was truly bizarre. But it's all good, honestly. I know what the adrenaline rush is going to be like when the real thing happens. I'm telling you right now. I've thought about I've thought about it all so many times that you know, you know what would what would it be like when you look up and and see the giant ship above Los Angeles? Right? Now I've had a practice run. I'm being serious. I now know what it's going to be like and how I'm going to react. And I'm telling you, it went from head to toe, that woof, that adrenaline rush. It was friggin' cool. Seriously. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black tonight. Kathleen Martin joins us. We're going to be talking about her new book. It is releasing tonight. You can get your copy now, Forbidden Knowledge. You can get it over on Amazon. You can also go to KathleenMartin.com. And uh, the links for her website are up in social media. They're in the video description box below, and they're over on our website. Tomorrow night, Freddie Silva is back with us. Wednesday night, John Greenwald is here at NSA Doc. We got John on the show keeping it real. Thursday night is another fader night with open lines all night long. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be right back after this short break with tonight's guest, Kathleen Martin. Stay with us. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who. And you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan small batch roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. This is the only way forward. This is Made to Black. Make contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, folks. It's trembling times, and fear is pushing emotions, which in turn pushes health the wrong direction. Do you ever get an ache because life is uneasy? Try Life Change Tea at getthetea.com. Life Change Tea works on your digestive tract, helping to move food through quicker and comfortably so your health is spot on. Life Change Tea may not help with world issues, but it will help with your digestive issues. A glass a day helps keep the intruders away. So, change your life today. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. If your health game is off, get on by ordering Life Change Tea. GetTheTea.com. And while you're on our site, look around at the great non-GMO organic supplements. And if you're a sales shopper, go to our specials page and see what's for you. 
I've been drinking the tea for 12 years, and I'm sure glad for its health benefits. Again, that's getthetea.com. Getthetea.com. The tea that makes you go. The new KUNXDB, the UNX Network, bringing you the best in paranormal programming in premium, high-definition streaming audio and video. Log on to the network at unxnetwork.com and check out the growing lineup of programs, including Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and many more. Sign up for the free UNX newsletter, follow the UNX blog, or pick up the latest edition of the UNX magazine. Be sure Sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So check us out at unxnetwork.com. Tap the show page and the calendar so you never miss your favorite live shows and podcasts. We are your portal for all things paranormal. The X, explaining the unexplained. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Kathleen Martin joins us. This is really cool. We we are announcing the release of her book today, right now on Fade to Black. I love that when that happens. Tomorrow night, Freddie Silva is with us. Wednesday night, John Greenwald. And then, of course, Thursday is another Fader night with open lines all night long. Tonight... Kathleen is with us to announce the release of her book. It's called Forbidden Knowledge, A Personal Journey from Alien uh, Alien Abduction to Spiritual Transformation. She's an author. She's an on-camera expert. She's a consultant, international conference presenter, experiencer advocate, intergenerational experiencer. More on that tonight, of course, and a hypnosis practitioner. Since 1990, She has researched the perplexing nature of UFOs and the non-human entities associated with uh, highly advanced aerial vehicles via her own groundbreaking research, investigation, and experimentation. She is the 2021 recipient of the International UFO Congress Lifetime Achievement Award. For 30 years, she she has engaged scientifically focused research on ET experiencers, the history of government involvement in major UFO studies, and the U.S. government's obfuscation of the facts. Now, her interest in UFOs and contact began in 1961 when her aunt and uncle, Betty and Barney Hill, had a close encounter and subsequent abduction in New Hampshire's White Mountains. We're going to discuss a little bit of that tonight, too, as well. Her website is right there. It's Kathleen-Martin.com. I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, Kathleen Martin. Kathleen, good evening, young lady. How are you? Good evening, Jimmy. It's <laughs> nice to be with you again. You know, I, I love your smile. I say it every time. It just it just brightens the room. And and welcome back to the program. And Thank you. I, I I I almost don't know where to start with this book. And um, some very strange. Um, okay, you know what. Let me let me actually start here before I get into synchronicities uh, because I find that very strange uh, with the book because I just got the book, but there were some things that happened with me over the last couple of weeks and the timing of this book and some things. So we're going to get into that. I I just I, I enjoy it when it happens. I recognize, but um, this is. Let me let me start here, and I don't want you to feel uncomfort- uncomfortable with what I'm about to say, but I want the audience to understand that uh, Kathleen and I um, have gotten to know each other uh, over the years, and I so appreciate her, her presence. Uh, she glows. She lights up the room. Uh, she's got an amazing smile, and there was something about her, this endearing 
quality that um, that I just appreciate. Okay, but I didn't know why, Kathleen. I just didn't know why. And this book really, really opened my eyes uh, to who you are. And it must have been, uh, I, I don't want to use the word difficult, but a challenge for you to just lay it all out because you do. And your opening lines in the book, it might be in, in the introduction, you said, or you say, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I didn't know if I could do this, right? I didn't know if I was going to be able to open up. And I thought, okay, this is an interesting introduction to the book, but you do open up. Some very personal things are in this book. Why did you choose to to do this, to just lay it all out and show us who you are? It just seemed to be the right time to do this. Uh, I thought that it was important that people knew and know who I really am, that uh, I, uh, I'm a lot different than a lot of people think. I have a different history. Uh, and I just, it seemed that it was time. I have been an advocate for experiencers for many, many years. I thought I would take these secrets to my grave, but uh, I have been speaking to small groups of people or uh, over the past several years, uh, but most people don't know that I'm an experiencer. And uh, I thought that it would help others. I thought it would p give readers insight into what experiencers go through as children and how different family structures and behaviors can have an impact on children and the consequences of growing up in a family where uh, people are being abducted by aliens and uh, you know that that secret now, when I was studying sociology and psychology, we, we learned about uh, families who coveted secrets and uh, that it wasn't a good thing for, for this to happen in families. But uh, sometimes it's important. Sometimes it can destroy a family, destroy the family's income, destroy the reputation. If the uh, public knows the truth. And here is the point right there. You just arrived at it that so many, and I understand why they want to, they want to know what the aliens look like. They want to know what the ship was like. They want to get to the sensational parts about, and I get that. I, I do too. But there's everything else that is going on in your life and others' life. There's other things that are happening that uh, are involved with this subject at the same time. And we, we sometimes don't get to know the person or what is going on. You went through husbands, right? You went yes. through uh, uh, the raising of your children, Single, married, uh, health issues. Uh, you were constantly uh, given probably your fair share of life's challenges around everything else with uh, with ETs and contact and and dealing with that at the same time. But we never know who who Kathleen Martin is. And, and you absolutely did not hold back. All of that is in this book, isn't it? It is, Jimmy. You know, I was uh, speaking with Ray Hernandez from uh, Free and uh, now uh, Consciousness Group and, and telling him about the book that I was writing. And he said, Kathy, don't hold anything back. Tell it all. And I said, you know, I will. I will tell it all. Now, <laughs> uh, oh man, 
there are some moments in this book where uh, I find myself wondering what I would do if I was in the same position. And it's uh, it, you write it in such a in such a way that um, uh, I, I, how do I say this correctly? You write this in such a way that we are able to go on this journey with you, and then absolutely sit back and go, how how, how did she make it through? How 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 is that possible? And then I think about who you are today. Um, you know, this bright, beaming, smiling individual. And that's how you got to who you are today, isn't it? It absolutely is. And, you know, all of us have challenges in life. And uh, I came from a very strong family of women. And uh, my father was uh, a Scotsman and, and French my grandfather on my mother's side was uh, Irish. My grandmother was English, uh, one of the first English families to come to this country. There was strength in my family and cohesiveness and a lot of love. And, and it was a family where no matter who you are, were or who you are, you may not love that person's behavior but you must love and respect that person because they're a family member and you must give them the right to be themselves. Did you revisit these moments uh, differently uh, as you're writing the book? Uh, did you start to go back uh, through these different life events and, and, and live them again? And, and if you did, uh, how easy was that to, to go through? I did go back and relived them. That's the only way that I could write in detail right. about them. And, and you know, sometimes I wept when I was writing, um, when, when they were particularly emotionally trying times. And, you know, like the time when I was uh, a little girl and... Uh, I grew up on across the street from my grandparents' farm. My mother was a farmer. She was a milkmaid uh, every morning. And I just was so proud of her. I wanted to be just like my mother um, as she showed me how she uh, dumped the, the milk through filters and pasteurized the milk and explained uh, Louis Pasteur to me. And... I had a little plastic cow, and that was my favorite toy because my mother was milk, milking a brown cow, mm -hmm. and it had a little tail that was movable, and one day that tail fell off and went between the cracks in the floorboard and down to the concrete below, and... There was no uh, cellar that you could go into to retrieve it. So it was lost forever. And, and you know, here I am in my, <laughs> I hate to say it, in my 70s now. I don't feel that old. But um, here I am remembering myself when I was uh, probably two or three years old. Here um, in. Going he, through this. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. And. Uh, I, the way that you write about your grandparents and your grandmother is, 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 is really cool. Um, I'm not going to say any more than that. Uh, when everybody reads the book, you'll understand exactly what Kathleen and I are talking about, um, which takes us to uh, what I brought up uh, uh, in the intro, which is this. A couple of weeks ago, and well, okay, a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, I spent, uh, a big chunk of the show talking about our childhood memories and things and possible visions of, of the future. Um, and, and how I went through that as a small child and I didn't understand it then, although I understand it now, but I'm even more interested in the possible paranormal or supernatural aspect of that, where how could I possibly know my future? 
and I ask the audience just to go back and think about your childhood. And and did you have any moments like mine? And I was very interested in that and, and how it shapes us as adults. Well, I get your book and childhood events and memories, right? <laughs> and and you the book is basically around that idea and concept. And you spend an entire chapter on how our childhood's uh, uh, events and memories shape us as adults. And that is the craziest synchronicity for me to, to, to dedicate uh, a show to this. And it's something that I've been speaking about for a couple of years on this show. And this is what has shaped this book, isn't it? Yes, it absolutely is. Uh, the, especially the beginning of the book where, where I talk in great detail about uh, different parenting styles and how those parenting styles have an impact on uh, the children's lives into adulthood and how some uh, who have particularly challenging uh, childhood experiences with erratic parents with parents who lash out at them, uh, who beat them, uh, would have a great deal of difficulty going through life as experiencers as well, and how dissociation can become a coping style. One of the uh, one of the reasons why I I haven't talked much about specific things about the way that uh, I grew up is that as an adult now, I, I honestly believe that nobody had an, an easy childhood, right? <laughs> nobody. I think that's true. I, I know, nobody had, <laughs> especially in our generation, right? And um, in that there may have, there may be children out there that didn't have issues growing up. That's rare, but they are probably the ones that are the most messed up today, right? That that <laughs> that those that went through challenges uh, as a child um, are are better suited as an adult to deal with things, right? They build and develop good coping mechanisms right. over time. And that's what's so important about carrying us through adulthood successfully. Now, let's, let's talk about you specifically. Um, uh, how did your childhood shape you into who you are today? I was very lucky to have uh, wonderful, loving parents, to have grandparents across the street, an aunt and uncle uh, in the house next to my grandparents who owned a farm, a dairy and chicken farm, poultry farm. And uh, so I've, that was extraordinarily important. I only got hit once when I was a child. And we were, my brothers and I were raising Cain. We were supposed to be going to sleep. And my mother came in and she said, and this isn't in the book, but she said, if you don't cut it out and go to sleep, I'm going to spank you. And uh, she said, I don't want to do this, but it's for your own good. And, and we continued to, to raise Cain. And so she came in to spank me and she said now I really don't want to do this but it's for your own good so every time she struck me and she only struck me once to begin with I said thank you <laughs> she struck me again and I said thank you <laughs> it shows that I'm a stubborn person <laughs> I still am today but uh, she was not very pleased <laughs> by my response you, you know what my mom used to do um, I don't, ev I don't remember ever being spanked by my mom, but it was the threat, right? Okay. Oh, yes. So what she would do is she would crack the belt at the bottom of the stairs and act like she was coming up the stairs. We jump in bed, you know, and quiet down. It was the threat. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, the threat was there. Yeah. The threat was there. You <laughs> know, was a kid. 
she <laughs> she never followed through, but uh, the cracking of the belt, that's a great, a great childhood memory. Um, now, what about uh, the, I'm just going to use the word paranormal as a, just an overall overarching term to use here. But that was something that uh, was also in the background uh, with you growing up, certainly uh, up until uh, when it really came apparent with uh, your aunt and uncle in 1961. But um, what are your memories of, of the paranormal and the supernatural? I don't remember uh, paranormal activity in my home as a child except for once in a while, I would wake up and there would be a dark figure mm-hmm. over me. And for years, when I learned, you know, after I learned about sleep paralysis, I w- would always wonder, and I didn't remember being paralyzed. But when I saw that, I would scream bloody murder and put my head under the covers, and my mother would come running. And she never told me that she saw that dark shadow over me, too. Until I was an adult, and she was uh, was late in her life. Now, um, and we're going to uh, uh, discuss this a little bit uh, further after the break. In in 1961, um, when this uh, the incident with uh, your aunt and uncle Betty and Barney Hill, uh, when this revealed itself, did you understand the concept of ETs or UFOs? I did not understand that concept at that time. Uh, It wasn't anything that was ever discussed in front of me. And I found out on that very day, September 20th, 1961, that my mother had had a fairly close encounter with what we think of as a mothership, a huge cigar-shaped craft with smaller craft flying around it. Uh, back, I believe it was in 1957 or 1958, and she went grocery shopping every Friday night. Another aunt was with her. They were returning home in the dark when they, they saw this. They were driving, and they stopped the car uh, at a home. They knew the people who lived there. The people went out with my mother and my aunt and, and looked at this craft that was just hovering over a field. And what did uh, did did your mom? Uh, I'm just going to go with Betty. I'm going with the female side of this. I'm going with the feminine side. Did they discuss this? I know only that my mother, after this happened, had told Betty and Barney when they were visiting. They they came at least once a week, and I I wasn't there to hear it. But uh, Barney did not believe that it could possibly be a UFO, extraterrestrial, flying saucer, whatever you want to call it uh, back then. And uh, Betty thought, well, it might be possible. But Barney definitely thought it was uh, mistaken identity. There is, um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, you briefly I, I shouldn't say briefly, but the book is not about Betty and Barney um, specifically. But, of course, this is uh, something that helped shape your life and, and your involvement with that. Um, and the inclusion of your aunt and uncle in the book, um, could the book have been written without uh, the Betty and Barney Hill incident uh, chapter? I don't think that it could have because not everyone knows who I am. Right. That that they are my aunt and uncle. And I wanted it to be a book that was about my life story. And they had an important part in it. So I, I wrote a, a little tiny bit in one chapter about their experience just to give a brief overview for people. But I talked more about the impact that it had on me and what I saw. Exactly. It's, uh, it was a, a really, really well-done treatment uh, to Betty and Barney. And, and again, it, 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 this is a book about your life and the transformation that you went through. And it was just very interesting how you spoke about your aunt and uncle. And we're going to talk about that when we come back after this short break. This is Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church. 
Tonight, Kathleen Martin is with us, and we, her new book releases today. It's called Forbidden Knowledge. The links for everything are right there on social media. I'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, BX. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Hello, I'm Katie and you're listening to my very man, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to jimmychurchradio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're of the Honey Brothers. <laughs> we are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official fader not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright-Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of The Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. <laughs>
Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Kathleen is Martin. Uh, Kathleen Martin is with us. Her new book releases today. It is called Forbidden Knowledge, and the links not only to her website, but, but over to Amazon or right there in social media. And uh, the book releases tonight, and uh, Kathleen is with us. How exciting. Let's celebrate this. Um, you you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, so I want to uh, go back and revisit um, this, um, uh, specifically about Barney. And in the book, you address this, but I think you address more directly the thought. You don't really explore, because the book is not about Betty and Barney Hill, but you uh, say a couple of things um, in the book, and I want your insight on this. Which is that um, uh, when your mom brought up her experience, uh, Barney was like, I can't be a UFO. And there's this quote uh, that you had mentioned in the past when uh, Betty, your aunt, asked Barney if he now believed in flying saucers. And and he replied, don't be ridiculous. Right? <laughs> Yes, and, even though he had just been taken, although he had been standing in a field and observed that craft at uh, hovering only a hundred feet above him and making him feel from the behavior of those entities on the craft that he was going to be captured like a bug in a net. They are captured. They don't remember the capture. They only remember those uh, code-like buzzing sounds striking the trunk of the car, the way the car vibrated, the electrical tingling sensation that passed through their bodies before they found themselves on another track of road 30 to 35 miles away from where they had been previously. And uh, it's just unbelievable that Barney was still saying, oh, no, Betty, don't be ridiculous. I, I'll prove to you that I can produce that sound. And he stopped the car and he drove it from one side of the road to the other. He did everything he could to reproduce that sound and he couldn't. Now, and is it is it a situation where, uh, and I'm not cracking a joke, but it is kind of funny if you think about it, um, where you just got to go, Barney. Okay, so what's it gonna take, right? What <laughs> what what do you need to be put on the table here to to change the way that you're viewing this experience, right? Yes, and you know, Barney always uh, challenged Betty always kidded Betty. He liked to get uh, an emotional reaction from Betty. So he would do things just to tease her and say the opposite of what she wanted. So that's that was part of her his personality and his behavior. But when they arrived home, he said to her, don't ever tell anyone about this no good can ever come of it. And then when they went to the car uh, with a compass to hold it over those shiny spots that were in the area of the trunk where they heard those buzzing sounds, Barney just said, I have to forget about this to himself. I have to forget about this right away. We can't pay attention to this. Do you think that um, uh, it was almost impossible for Barney to accept everything? I think that it was so emotionally damaging to Barney that he didn't want to, and he thought that he could just push it down. Betty was extraordinarily curious about it, so of course he was never going to push it down completely because of her interest. Right. But for him, he wanted to forget about it. He was the one who ended up in the hospital with a bleeding ulcer, a life-threatening ulcer with uh, high blood pressure. And that is what led him to uh, be referred to Dr. Benjamin Simon for treatment. And D Benjamin Simon was the neuropsychiatrist who treated 
Betty and Barney. Well, he Betty wasn't going to be a patient, but she went and asked if she could be. And he decided to accept her as well, but he would see them separately and reinstate amnesia at the end of each session so they couldn't compare stories. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And for you, um, you were very young. You were 12 at the time. How old were you? I was 13 when I Yeah, 13, 13. Okay, so you're 13 years old. So let's talk about you for a second. You have a close-knit family. This is your aunt and uncle. Um, You were at the home with the rest of the family after everything happened. But as a 13-year-old, you also know Barney before the incident. And you know your Uncle Barney after the incident. As a 13-year-old, how did you uh, accept seeing this this change in your uncle? It was very difficult for me. I wanted to help him. I, you know, I devoted my life to helping others. Uh, so I, I had that cam- compassion. Right. I wanted to do anything I could to help him. And it seemed that he was struggling with memories, struggling to remember what happened during those two hours of missing time. And of course, he had the evidence. He had the conscious recall of observing those entities in, in the craft and uh, knowing there was the physical evidence, the missing time. It troubled him terribly. And he thought that maybe if he could just remember what happened during that two hours, that it would help him. And so I always tried to help him, um, to comfort him in, in a way, but to help him to, well, I know today that it's an ab reaction, mm-hmm. but he did have that ab reaction. In my childhood home at the dining room table, when my mother and I and Betty were there trying to help him, and uh, he he had this breakthrough memory uh, of finding himself sitting in the car with the roadblock ahead on that dirt road, and those non-human entities coming toward him and he had then conscious recall of those entities and the way they walked. They did not walk with a human gait. And uh, there was a huge release of emotion. I'll never forget it. Were were you, um, again, you, not, 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 not the rest of your family, but Kathleen Martin at that moment, did you, did you feel a, a possible sense of relief that, okay, I got my uncle back everything's going to be okay or was this just the beginning of the struggle because now he's consciously remembering things i would say it's more the beginning of the struggle right uh he he was troubled uh, right up until the point where he had completed his uh hypno analysis with dr benjamin simon uh, so then I had my uncle back. Before that, he he was on edge. And uh, a lot of times when he and Betty would come to visit my, my childhood home, uh, she would be in the house with us, but he would be walking the backlands of the family farm. He wouldn't be there. He didn't want to hear her talk about her obsession with this craft and what happened and what the evidence was right right he didn't want to hear he didn't want to hear about it it troubled him deeply now and um this isn't uh i'm glad that you didn't expand on this in the book so i'm not doing a big reveal here but i'm going to ask your thoughts on one of the statements that you made in the book um, and you just left it there for the reader to to think about. But now I want to know where your mind was uh, when you wrote this. But you mentioned that the stress of remembering things uh, possibly uh, was what caused uh, your uncle's health issues and and possibly even his death seven years later um, so quickly. Um, so why would you... Uh, what what made you say this in this fashion in the book? 
Well, I think that he he had held so much of these emotions inside and being a black man growing up in uh, segregated Virginia for part of his uh, childhood. And, uh, you know, obviously any black man, any man of color who grew up in that time frame would be deeply impacted. Uh, Barney was a highly intelligent man. His IQ was 140. He wanted to go to college, but he couldn't go to college because of the color of his skin. Mm -hmm. He ended up going into the army shortly before World War II. And uh, he, he was in an explosion. There had to have been an, um, an emotional impact, pre-existing uh, trauma, anxiety from all of that. And you add that trauma of that missing time event of observing these non-humans, of being frightened beyond belief and you know having to reconcile all of this in his mind something that he s simply did not believe and suddenly he was faced with the realization that this was real it, it was uh it had an, a, an incredibly uh traumatic impact on barney and uh, did he ever, in in uh, you know certainly the last part of his life, did he did he did he ever come to terms with it? After he saw Doctor Simon, when he was finished with his treatment, he did come to terms with it. He was a, a strong, proud leader among black men in Southern New Hampshire. Uh, Pease Air Force Base was there, so uh, he was not the only black man in the area. There have always been black families in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And uh, he was actively involved in the civil rights movement. He had been appointed to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights as the state advisory board member. Uh, he was active in the community. He'd received an award from Sergeant Shriver for setting up the Rockingham County Community Action Program with funding from the Federal Office of Economic Opportunity. So he was very active. He was doing the things that he wanted to do, that he loved to do. He was able to put uh, these memories of this abduction aside and to know that he could go on with his life, it was over with, he could forget about it, it was confidential, it was never going to be revealed to the public. And, and he was fine until it was. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's such an emotional, uh, uh, the way that it's um, uh, written about in the book from your perspective this is your life. These are some of the things that you were dealing with um, that not only uh, uh, continued because this this UFO ET incident was was just the beginning. And as you move on through the book, um, uh, speaking about your life, I want to go to an event. <laughs> and I'm just going to say this. And then I want you to uh, take off. But you talk about uh, your new life in Crested Butte, Colorado, 1978. Now, uh, we're, um, your relationship with your aunt is still going on. And we're, we're going to circle back to that. Um, but uh, you, you've got a new life. It's 1978. It's Crested Butte. But you write, I want you to complete this sentence, <laughs> and it's incredible. <laughs> you write, and I quote, one night I am missing, and my neighbors are searching for me after they see a craft hovering near my home, end quote. What the heck, Kathleen? <laughs> right? <laughs> Yes, it's Jimmy. Uh, and I, I knew I was going to be taken that night. 
my neighbors had a close encounter with a craft outside the condominium that we all lived in. And uh, they were looking for me because they knew of my interest in the topic. They knew they met my aunt when she came to visit and uh, they couldn't find me because I was probably on that craft. You can't stop there. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, this book is a page turner and, and I'm letting the audience know this is an actual sentence uh, typed by Kathleen. And uh, so, so what happened? And um, what time of night, by the way? Oh, it was uh, probably around 11 o'clock, midnight, something like that. Out in Crested Butte, people generally slept late and uh, then stayed up late at night. Uh, socializing. I was different from the rest, uh, com being a, a Yankee from, from New Hampshire, where uh, we were always up early because you could get the work done and, you know, that sort of thing, and, uh, especially growing up on a farm. So uh, I was different from the rest of them. Uh, they, But I was not sleeping in my bed that night. Uh, I'm sure that I had gone into my bedroom uh, when they were looking for me, uh, we didn't have to lock our doors out there. People would just walk in or if, uh, or they would pound on the door. Uh, they wanted to find me and, uh, they couldn't. And, uh, how long were you gone? I'm not certain how long I was gone because they thought, oh, well, she must be somewhere. They didn't realize I was on the craft. Right. I did, I'm, in fact, I'm not certain that I was, but why was it hovering outside my bedroom window <laughs> that close And uh, <laughs> if I wasn't? Right, right, right. And when did you show back up? Uh, the next morning, uh, I woke up and I knew that something had happened. And uh, so I asked my roommates about that, and uh, they thought that uh, they had vague memories, vague memories of something happening. Um, I remembered being, I think that was this time, on the other side of the condo. Um, I, was, I was taken on a beam. Uh, of, of sorts up into this craft and uh, I remembered finding myself in in some sort of almost like a, an antique dentist chair maybe it was it, but it was very comfortable at the same time it seemed it just it, it wasn't uh, constructed in a very sturdy way from my memory of it but I was lying on it and there was an entity that was staring into my eyes and I there were these very large eyes staring into mine and I I could feel this incredible feeling of love coming from those eyes and I thought to myself does this being love me or does he love the taste of my flesh? That's what thought went through my mind. I'm not sure if I put that in the book. No, you didn't. And I am <laughs> just, and it isn't, isn't that interesting? Um, you could go anywhere in your thoughts, but, but you went there. Um, why do you think that, why do you think that is? The tasting of the flesh part. I don't know. I really don't know why. I guess it was that I did not have trust. You that. didn't see like a table setting in the background with 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 a napkin and, and a knife and fork. There wasn't any. <laughs> there wasn't any indication of dinner. No, no, there wasn't. But I didn't trust them. I was always afraid that I wouldn't be returned, that uh, they were doing something to me like they did to my aunt, 
uh, t- probably removing ova. Right. And I wondered if they were growing these babies as food. That's what I was wondering. But and- it was because I was so frightened, I think. It was so negative for me back then. I didn't understand what was happening, even though uh, the love was projected toward me. I didn't trust it. And it took me uh, many, many years to overcome that distrust, that feeling that I just wanted it all to go away, to that I couldn't even walk at night without trepidation uh, in my own home. And I couldn't sleep. I had great difficulty with that because of the fear. But finally, I decided that if I was going to make it through all of this and become a whole person, I had to devise a plan to do that. And I had to stop being fearful. And I had to gain that strength inside me that came from from my family. Right. And, and use that strength. Yes, yes, yes. And and you, you so you, you um, uh, I don't know where, how far along in the timeline this is, but you, you talk about hanging out with your aunt, Aunt Betty, and, and, and talking through things. And one of the, and this is, I don't know if this is related to this experience in 1978, 79 in Butte, uh, Crested Butte. But Betty says to you that no one should be frightened of contact, and that's uh, that's a very interesting thing. Why do why do you think she gave you this advice uh, to share with everybody else? Well, she thought that they were just astronauts coming from another planet, and that they were just interested in our family. maybe doing a sociological study on us. And uh, she didn't have that fright that I had. But I was younger. You know, I was 17 years old when I was taken. And then uh, taken periodically from time to time. I was probably uh, 27, 28 years old when that craft was hovering outside my condominium in Crested Butte. Uh, Betty was older, um, and I think and Betty was a lot stronger, I think, at that point than I was. Mm-hmm. Betty uh, was brave. I mean, Betty owned her own pistol. Betty was a social worker for the state of New Hampshire, and she, I know a story of her where one time one of her foster children, a teenage girl, had a boyfriend who escaped from jail and the the foster girl ran away and was holed up in a hotel room motel room with this criminal and the police were all outside and they called Betty this is at night and she went and she was on the bullhorn saying to the girl I'm Betty Hill, and you get your butt out of there right now. I'm not going to wait around for you. Get yourself dressed and get out of that room. And the girl did it. She said, <laughs> Betty said, if you don't come out, I'm coming in after you. <laughs> it was that kind of thing. She was just, she was so brave. Uh, that's she was inter- incredible. Yeah, so, so dude is in the hotel room saying, what are you doing? As she's putting on her socks. That's Betty Hill. <laughs> I'm out of here, man. <laughs> you can deal That's with That's my caseworker. I'm going to be in jail, too. If, That's it. I'm out. out. I'm out. Um, when we come back, uh, we're going to take a, a quick break right here. Um, but I'm going to stay uh, right here in this period of your life. Because I'm, when we come back, I want to talk about your two husbands, uh, what you went through there, and, and your kids and your family life. If that's okay, it's in the book. It, it, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, uh, so we're going to discuss this when we come back. You ready? Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Our guest tonight, Kathleen Martin. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is the night that Kathleen releases her new book. It is called Forbidden Knowledge. This conversation continues after this short break. Stay with us. Yeah. 
out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! This is Jimmy Church. Jason Martell's book, Knowledge Apocalypse, 10-Year Anniversary Edition, is now available. Most ancient cultures speak of a time when their gods visited them. They never say their gods came from across the ocean or from the mountains. They always came down from the skies. Was ancient man visited by gods or extraterrestrials? We have not been told the full truth about our human past. There was a time when all the ancient cultures lived amongst beings they considered their gods. The search for truth leads us down the path of learning where the ETs might come from and why they are here. To understand some of these advanced topics and learn the truth about human origins, buy the new book from Jason Martell, Knowledge Apocalypse. Now in its 10-year anniversary edition available on Amazon.com by clicking on the banners over on our site or simply visit JasonMartell.com. That's JasonMartell.com. Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com. You are listening to Fate to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Kathleen Martin is with us. Her new book has just released. It is called Forbidden Knowledge. Tomorrow night, Freddie Silva is back. And Wednesday night, John Greenwald is here. Thursday is open lines all night long. And we're talking about uh, the new book. And although I'm no spoilers here, I'm not going to give anything away. Um, but uh, Kathleen's insights uh, for how the book was written and why uh, are what we are discussing tonight. And 
there is um, uh, a significant part of this book for me that I emotionally connected to, Kathleen, was uh, your, your, your family and uh, 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 two, uh, two marriages uh, that are addressed early in the book. Uh, of course, um, getting pregnant, having kids, and the struggles that you went through both in your marriages and also as as a single mom and and what and and in that period of history um it was a difficult thing for a, a single mom uh to go through too as well but you went through uh bliss too as well <laughs> in your marriages where you had these highs and lows how did all of this uh, uh the ET and UFO contact um, impact uh, your family life. Oh, okay. You're muted. You're not coming through, Kathleen. Un unmute yourself, young lady. Okay. Strange. Uh, I, I I haven't changed anything here. See if you've got a button that you need to press. Oh, there it is. I heard it close. Do you have it now? Yeah, now we're back. You can. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> uh, after the the dramatic question, <laughs> how and, and so uh, you know just briefly um, uh, the question again briefly I should say um, how did uh, how did all of the, this impact your family life? It it made it more difficult because I would disappear during the night. Um, my, I'm not sure if my first husband was aware of this, but my second husband definitely was and was taken too. So, uh, and he did not, uh, he was not happy about that some of the times. So, um, yeah, and and for my first husband, it was uh, he was a brilliant man. Uh, he graduated uh, first in his class from the University of New Hampshire, Phi Beta Kappa, summa cum laude, um, and uh, he was studying the philosophy of psychiatry in Cincinnati. And I was so proud of him, and and we had a wonderful relationship, really. And, you know, he was going to uh, get his master's degree and then I was going to be able to uh, s stop working at my teaching position that I had when I was there and do my graduate work too. And so I was uh, just actually ready to begin graduate school. I'd been accepted. I had a full scholarship. And uh, there were things that just uh, changed radically in our lives. Uh, and just sort of by mistake, a medical mistake maybe, something went wrong that uh, set us off on an entirely different course. I don't know if it had anything to do with paranormal activity or if it was just that medical mistake, but that medical mistake when he was having a tooth extracted changed his personality radically, changed who he was as a person. And he was so high functioning and, and just a great personality. He'd been president of his high school class. He was... Uh, center on the basketball team. He started out college with a basketball scholarship. He was a tall guy. I, I look, came up just above his waist, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm five feet tall. And uh, so it was, uh, it was this uh, that, that put us in a completely different place than I had ever envisioned or he had ever envisioned. It, it was tragic in a sense. 
and uh, I ended up leaving. And you can you'll read about everything that led up to that, right? And in in the book, but I I ended up realizing that I had to leave and leave everything behind. And I wanted more than anything to go to graduate school to finish graduate school. I was already going part time when I was teaching, um, but I wanted to earn my doctorate in school psychology. That was my plan. And and everything collapsed. And you, um, uh, again, it, it, it's in the book, and I, I don't want to leave a gap here, but um, you remarry, and that's when you uh, moved uh, to Crested Butte, uh, Colorado, and, and, and life is wonderful. Um, uh, you're pregnant, and uh, things also took another crazy turn in in your second marriage and again it was a health issue uh with your husband uh that uh surfaced very quickly um and you felt that i i, I want to know what was uh, in your mind that maybe and i'm sure looking back and and as you wrote this in the book you're starting to realize things you thought about this a lot that but maybe he was not telling the family about his his health issues. Can you share that with us? Did you felt like he was keeping a secret? He was definitely keeping a secret. And uh, he had sent uh, me, I was pregnant, sent uh, me and, and my baby uh, off to New Hampshire to visit the family. And when I was there, I received a phone call from his mother telling me that he had been diagnosed with kidney cancer and had a kidney removed. And uh, he didn't want me to know about it. He'd been having back aches. He'd had uh, a special seat built for himself in the van. Uh, he'd been going to a chiropractor. And uh, finally, he sought medical attention, and that's when they realized that uh, one of his kidneys uh, was malignant. And um, and well, uh, share with us. Um, ultimately, uh, what what ended up happening? Well, uh, we were going to live in Texas. We were not going to live in Colorado. We were going to be near the hospitals and, and medical treatment for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could not get a job because I was pregnant. Every place I went, I had this huge abdomen and uh, he couldn't work. And we ended up going back to Crested Butte and he did not get the medical treatment he needed and you know in the end it was it was fatal and 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 here's the point that that I'm getting to um you're pregnant and you're trying to go out and provide for your family but you couldn't get a job right and now that's right and 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 now he passes away and now you're single again out, out there in the world facing huge challenges. Now, you've got to do what you've got to do, right? That's just, it's just life. Um, and, and what was your state of mind? And, and, and how, do you, how, do you, how do you stay positive through this period? I was as stubborn as ever. I looked straight ahead, and I didn't care what it took. I was going to work 18 hours a day if I had to. I was going to be successful. I was going to put food on the table for my children. I was never, ever going to even think about welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I lived with my mother and paid her rent and, and started out slowly. Uh, you know, Back in New Hampshire, I had support, the support, emotional support. From my mother, my Aunt Betty gave me a loan so that I could purchase a car. And I uh, moved on and I worked extraordinarily hard and 
long hours. I uh, ended up meeting another man. I wasn't sure if uh, I should become involved with another man in my life. In a, in a way, I was wondering if I was Cancer Mary because my first husband had developed cancer. My second husband had developed cancer. Was there something about me that was causing this? And I would not want to afflict that on anyone else. And, um, you know, f eventually I did fall in love with m my my husband to whom I've been married now for 38 years. Right. And, uh, and he didn't get cancer. <laughs> Fortunately, we have a wonderful, happy marriage. We're the best of friends. And uh, we raised my two boys and his three boys together. Now, um, and, and watching you smile as you say that says it all. And uh, going back to my point, I know you today. I've known you for about ten years, but but I, I I didn't know about your life's journey, and it is truly a hero's journey. Um, and now let's go back. Let's go back. I, I, I want you to finish this thought. This is another one that uh, stopped me right there, and I had to go back and read this. A couple of times, and as uncomfortable as it is for me to uh, read this and ask you about this, this is your personal experience, and you type these words. You said, and I quote, In the morning, I sense pain in my abdomen and discover a droplet of dried blood on my navel. End quote. Now, that's, that's extraordinary. Um, take us through this, and why would the, why was this included in the book? It was there because they were taking over, and I had hoped that all of that had stopped in Crested Butte, and now here I was back in New Hampshire, and I was being taken again, and I I realized that they inserted that needle into my abdomen to uh, extract ova um, for babies that they were raising on that craft for you know a hybridization program that they were involved in for some reason when i was pregnant i was very fearful that they were going to take that fetus from me. I was terrified. I don't know why, but there had to be something buried deep in my mind that told me that this was happening, this sort of thing. I had only had one hypnosis session with Dr. James Harder, uh, and this was before I moved to Crested Butte, I believe. Maybe I was living in Crested Butte. I, I'm not sure. Uh, but it was in the 1970s when he came to New Hampshire and he was studying this theory of his that th this kind of thing was, uh, abduction was intergenerational. And uh, attempting to discover why. And so he investigated uh, the abduction of my mother of myself. He, he even worked with my Aunt Betty. And um, he asked her if she was ever taken again more than one time. And she said, and I have the tape recording, that they came to visit her about once a year. Right. And Jim said to, to Betty, why do you think that is? And she said, oh, they probably just want to know who my friends are. <laughs> Did, <laughs> that was um, typical of Betty. <laughs> and when, yes, uh, We could spend the rest of the show just on that statement. Um, the, the sight of a drop of dried blood uh, anywhere on your body, let alone uh, next to your navel, uh, is a cause for alarm. 
uh, I haven't had that happen to me. And so we can just say that. But how much of it, when you see the dried blood, how much is there as a direct thought? How much of it is a conscious thought, um, uh, you know, as far as memories go? Because you got to ask yourself, how did that get here, right? Okay, so when you're going through that moment, how much of it was just right in front of you? It was. It was, I, I felt the pain. I felt kind of a pinching sensation. I saw the blood, and it was like, oh, no, not again. Not again. Why can't this stop? You know, that, that's what it was in, in that time frame in my life where I was terrified. And, and it was just terribly distressing uh, because there was nothing I could do about that. I could, I could impact everything else in my life or work really hard at it, at least uh, determined that I was going to succeed. But with that and that point in time, I felt that I had no control over what was happening in my life regarding alien abduction. Do you remember um, uh, uh, the abduction itself, Uh, how you uh, how you were taken and where you were taken to? I remembered uh, there were times where I was awake uh, in bed when I was taken. And I remember just those glistening eyes um, that I somehow my husband was shut off um, and uh, how I was sitting up and uh, not wanting to be taken and how I was taken through a pane of glass. Right onto a hovering craft outside the house. I lived in a very rural area on five acres of land. And uh, so it was pretty easy for them uh, to take me without being seen, I suppose, except for the Pease Air Force Base was 20 miles away. How many, um, up to this point, I'm talking about the dried blood uh, incident in New Hampshire. Um, how frequent was this contact and the abduction experience? It's, as far as I know, it was not frequent when I was a, a child. But when I was of reproductive age, mm-hmm. in uh, my, I know in my mid to late 20s to my mid 30s, I was taken um, se- probably several times a year. And then it, it slowed down over time. You um, you shared with me. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say uh, this was about three years ago, and you were at a UFO conference. Uh, you were with a couple of friends, uh, mutual friends, and you were driving back. This was in Florida, and uh, uh, you guys were driving. Um, I want you to, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this didn't end in your mid thirties, right? It did not. Um, this was a, a very recent, um, experience. And I remember you and I talking, it was either like the next day and you had just had a, a session, um, at your home and we talked, um, take us through that in that this didn't end in your 30s, and this was a very recent experience. Uh, and I'm sure you remember what I'm talking about right now. Yes, I think I do, because they're not that frequent anymore. And I don't think I've actually had one since 2015, probably. Right. But this was about 2013, and uh, Denise Stoner. That's right. It who, was Denise, yes. Yes, Denise Stoner, who... Uh, who is my co-author and an experiencer uh, on the alien abduction files uh, was was with me and my father was the other person who was with me my elderly father who uh, I was taking care of he was living in in my guest house across the, the driveway from my home 
And so we were going to uh, St. Pete to uh, a lecture, and Paula Harris was there. Right. And she was going to be speaking. And so we went down there for the day. Uh, Denise and I uh, would always meet. We live about, oh, probably an hour's drive away from one another, but we'd drive a uh, half hour in each other's direction. She'd park in a parking lot and I would drive us. So I drove us down to St. Pete and we had a quick dinner and then we were on our way home when suddenly the GPS in my fairly new car at that time uh, started malfunctioning. And I ended up, without thinking, pulling off the road. And there I was in a desolate area. And, I, and it suddenly hit me. What are you doing here? And I pulled over and I stopped the car. And I said, we have to get back on the highway. And so I went zooming out and back on the highway. I turned off the GPS. I knew the way anyway. Um, that was just there because we like to do a lot of talking. And so we're, we're all talking again in the car. And then suddenly I feel like the car is going up hill or going up into the air. Maybe it was, uh, and I was saying to myself, well, I didn't realize I was that tired. That, that I'm having this perceptual problem. I think I'm, my car is going up in the air. <laughs> and uh, then there's this period of time that I don't know what happened. But the car is coming back down on the highway. I can feel a touch. Denise and I resume talking. Her cell phone is not working. Uh, my father, who was actively involved in a conversation with us, is now asleep. And we drove on to the place where uh, she had parked her car. Now, that was probably it for me for that night. But uh, when she got into her car and started driving off her insulin pump that she was wearing was malfunctioning. She had a full battery. Her phone had been fully charged too. I didn't like using cell phones in those days, so mine was completely turned off. Um, but she had all of these problems. And so she decided, well, she was going to just drive home on a familiar route. It wasn't the one she always took, but it was familiar to her. And she's driving along and suddenly she finds herself on a narrow road next to a lake. And in Florida, the, there are tall uh, trees with uh, moss hanging off the trees. Uh, and in that kind of an area, because it's close to water. And she sees this huge red orb rising up out of the lake, and then she remembers her familiar entity stepping out from behind a tree. This is an entity that she's seen all of her life. And the next thing she knew, she was in her driveway. She didn't remember driving there. She didn't know how she got there. And her husband was inside, worried to death about her because she had not come home. She called me the following morning and told me what happened and that she was going to go out to find the place. She did go out. Uh, by the way, there was an electric, uh, electromagnetic anomaly uh, on her. She's a tremendous UFO investigator. She, she has is. all the equipment. She is. So on that uh, tri-field meter, she was able to measure an electromagnetic uh, anomaly. And uh, now, uh, but before we get to the break, okay, <laughs> let's talk about your dad. So, um, what did he have to say? 
Well, the following night, I felt that I had been taken. And uh, my dad uh, said, well, I saw this bright light out in the in the middle of the night. I got up and looked at it. He said, I think you were taken too. <laughs> It just never ends in, in, in your world, Kathleen. It just never ends. <laughs> and uh, I remember us having that conversation, and, it, you know, it, 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 it's a great experience. But it was your dad's comments uh, for me that I just found, you know, so wonderful. And, and how old was he at the time? Uh, he was about 90. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, the one and only Kathleen Martin, is with us. Her new book, Forbidden Knowledge, is out today. All the links for the book, you can go and get it. When we come back, we're going to talk about, uh, are you ready? We're going to talk about Francis. Can we talk about Francis when we come back, Kathleen? Oh, sure. We can talk about Francis. <laughs> we'll be right back. This is Rob Halford, the Mental God on Jimmy Church Radio.com. Your 1 million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, BX. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts, and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Why is it we're not very good with our health regiment? until it's too late. We don't put oil in the car until the engine blows up. When the body's out of balance, your health is not so good. Give your body some love. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Try our Life Change Tea, which cleanses you from harmful intruders. A clean colon is one of the ways to bring the body in balance. We also carry organic supplements to help you get where you need to go. So do your body a favor. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. You can even visit our sales page to save some dough. Uh, Does anybody call money dough anymore? Anyway, if you're looking for short, helpful health tips, go to YouTube and punch in Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. So log on to GetTheTea.com, shop, get balanced, then learn some cool tips at Health Matters Now. You'll be glad you did. That's GetTheTea.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon coffee banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Promo code F2B blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. When you're in the house for longer periods of time, you can see them flying or running across the floor. Ooh, yuck. They're unhealthy, gross, and disgusting. Bugs. I loathe bugs. We keep a clean home, but occasionally bugs show up. Well, I found something that is tougher than bugs. Orange Guard. On contact, it kills hidden bugs, including ants, roaches, and fleas. Plus, Orange Guard is a residual repellent. All of the ingredients of Orange Guard are on the FDA generally recognized as safe list. Orange Guard may be used around food, humans, and pets. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Orange Guard. Available at OrangeGuard.com, Whole Foods, and Ace Hardware. Gold loves chaos uncertainty and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about 
about the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure. United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534. Or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Kathleen Martin is with us. The new book, I've got it up there on Twitter. Uh, Everybody can go and check that out. Hashtag F2B. And uh, it is an amazing read. It's an amazing read. And and Kathleen, I can't let this conversation get away from us tonight without mentioning Stanton Friedman. And he must be smiling right now and just saying, good on you, Kathleen. You go. I bet he is. bet he is. In fact, a friend of mine here in Florida is a, a medium, highly psychic. And she knew Stanton uh, in fact, uh, he has come to visit her in spirit, and uh, she to- she just wrote to me today, and she said that uh, when she was meditating, Stanton came to her and uh, said that he was watching over me, and uh, that he wasn't too far away, and there was something about the color blue, and I don't, I still haven't figured that one out, but. Uh, yes. Yeah. He, right on. Right on. Around. You know, uh, we were uh, uh, we we shot this film last year, and a group of us uh, were sitting. It was myself, Richard Dolan, and Whitley, and and Linda, and uh, William Henry, and we were sitting having a conversation, and and we brought up Stanton, um, all of us, and and the comments were, man. Wouldn't he just be smiling today with everything that is going on with uh, UFOs and the UAP question and what's going on with Washington and the Department of Defense and this acknowledgement and this thing moving forward and how happy he would be right now to live through this moment with us and, and how much we missed him? We certainly do, and I think he does know what we're going through now if he's communicating with my friend and uh, he would be uh, extremely happy I think Mm -hmm. he did so much work over a 50 year period uh, advancing this knowledge despite the ridicule and uh, well he was the he was he was our spokesperson he was (laughs) he was the face you know, and uh, the the other part uh, for me, and I want to get back to the book, of course, and Francis Swan, but um, I think for all of us uh, that uh, are researching and investigating this subject with our own experiences, whatever brings us here, but when Stanton was on TV or Stanton was speaking on our behalf, uh, all that went through my mind was, I'm glad we have this guy, <laughs> right? <laughs> he, Absolutely. I mean, yes. He, he, you know, the, um, uh, the, he didn't, he wasn't, at least publicly, wearing the tinfoil hat or uh, was represented that way by the media, right? He was the centered physicist with his feet on the ground speaking for us and and it was just like i'm so happy it's it's stanton and he he represents us so well and that thought went through my mind every time he spoke yes he certainly did but 
sometimes he was not highly respected by the media, unfortunately, by the mainstream media. Um, he was ridiculed. He uh, was called a, a UFO enthusiast mm -hmm. instead of a nuclear physicist. So he was misrepresented. In fact, when Philip Klass was alive uh, and Donald Menzel was alive, uh, they caused other scientists to believe that Stanton was a charlatan. And uh, Donald Menzel, Dr. Donald Menzel from Harvard, said to Stanton, how can you be a scientist? No scientist would believe that UFOs are real. Right. <laughs> and, and I, I, I could, <laughs> yeah, I, I could almost do a Stanton impression right now in response to that. But uh, um, he, uh, he, he set me straight a couple of times, Kathleen, over the years. Mm -hmm. When when I would say something that was just a little bit too much, oh, Jimmy, you know, and he would set me straight. And, and I would sit back and go, uh, I just got, I just got schooled by Stanton. So I've got that going for me. Right. And, and he always centered me. He always brought me back. And, and that's what I loved about him so much. So anyway, uh, we could spend, uh, the rest of the night talking about Stanton Freeman. I miss mm -hmm. him so much. And I know you do too. And so does I the, do. And, you know, he, I have to say that Stanton was conservative. He had a scientific mind that would not go beyond a certain point. He had a really hard time with things like the idea that these ETs might be interdimensional, for example. Well, you know, and 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 I think that later on, um, okay, we can we can stay on Stanton. I think that later on, um, and I asked him directly, I said, is the door cracked open for you, Stanton, just a little bit to maybe explore these other ideas? And he said, Jimmy, I learn every single day. So he did have an open mind uh, when it came to these other, because none of us had all of the answers. And I think that Stanton, although, yes, you're right about his conservative aspect to this, but his mind was completely open, and I think he listened to everybody. He did listen, and he listened to me a lot. He uh, had conversations where he asked my opinion. He'd want to know what was going on in the UFO abduction, UFO contact field, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, when... When I first told him that I was an experiencer, he said, hmm, I'll put that in my gray basket. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, after we'd worked together for several years, he was convinced that I really it really did happen to me. I know he's happy today, though. It's an extraordinary book. And mm -hmm. uh, now let's talk about uh, Francis Swan. And um, you were you were given... I don't even know what to call it, an envelope, a satchel. Uh, you were given a bundle of, yes. <laughs> of, 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 of papers, 24 pages uh, to be exact, and of her uh, telepathic messages uh, from, let's just call them visitors. Um, and let's talk about those 24 pages, but the the other individuals around her uh, that are in this uh, particular story. Let me give you a little background first. Uh, Admiral, the the Admiral Knowles was my aunt Betty and my uncle Barney's friend. Uh, he and his wife they lived across the river from Betty and Barney. Now, Betty and Barney did not know him before they had their UFO experience. But after he retired from the Navy, he uh, was on the board of directors for NICAP. And so he heard about their story, got in touch with them, and invited them to his home. And what Betty and Barney found out was that uh, they were not ridiculed. They thought they would be. In fact, there were uh, people from the Canadian military there. 
uh, Wilbert Smith, who was the Canadian government's, he was a scientist, brilliant scientist, but he was uh, also their UFO guy. Uh, he had passed on at that point, but his wife was there. She worked for the Canadian government as well. And uh, they even had a fragment of, of metal. And there was a psychic there who held the, fr the metal in her hand and talked about uh, where it came from, that it was, recover it was recovered from a UFO crash into a river in, in Canada. And so Betty and Barney were relieved, and, and Betty became good friends with them. Of course, Barney died when he was 46, uh, not too long after the, the book was released. And uh, I, I wanted to know more, and I was looking for information. I, I have had a long-term interest in the history of government involvement in UFOs. And I went to Elliott, Maine, where they lived. I, I was not able to find any information because Admiral Knowles had passed on. Uh, his wife was no longer living there, or she had passed on as well. Uh, she had actually passed on, I found out. But so I couldn't write a lot about this in Captured. But I put the, the word out that I was looking for this information. And Admiral Knoll's granddaughter walked up to me. Stanton was sitting right beside me. This was at the Exeter, New Hampshire uh, UFO Festival. And she handed me a nice thick packet of papers and introduced herself. And she said, she gave me the originals. She said, you can take any of these that you want to photocopy and then send the originals back to me. And she said, I will give you permission to use any of that. In fact, I want you to use that information. And uh, so I was delighted. But at the same time, it involved communication with extraterrestrials, which is just really far out there at that time, I was thinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was about 2010. And so I just, I looked through everything. Stanton would frown on that sort of thing. And I just stored it in my file cabinet for years. And then I finally pulled it out and decided that I would read it over and, and see what I thought again. And this woman, Frances Swan, just lived in the same town as Admiral Knowles. Uh, she was involved in community affairs, that sort of thing. But one day when she was driving home, she was followed by this strange craft beside her car. And then when she arrived home, uh, not uh, too long after that, the, this uh, entity appeared in front of her, just materialized in her kitchen. Sometimes it was Jesus who materialized, but uh, she ended up having this entity waking her up at all times of the day and night, giving her telepathic messages that she would hear and she would write as quickly as she could. And she finally compiled all of these messages and she took them to Admiral Knowles. He was a rear admiral, by the way, uh, but we called him Admiral Knowles. She gave the pa packet to him and he read the papers inside and he believed that they were so scientifically advanced and so important to national security that he sent them to Margaret Chase Smith, the U.S. Senator from Maine, and she sent them to Dwight Eisenhower. So then the CIA, the FBI, the Navy, um, the Air Force, all became interested in doing this secret work with Frances Swan. And the messages that they were giving her 
Wilbert Smith from the Canadian government was uh, involved in this as well. And so, uh, of course, actively was uh, Admiral Knowles. And they were receiving these messages from Francis Swan. And they uh, were attempting to scientifically verify the information. And finally, they, they did well, verify some oh, of it. Let me, let me ask you this. Were they uh, approaching this? By the way, the chapter in this book, the en enigmatic uh, Mrs. Swan, Mrs. Swan is a page turner. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. But but I have to ask you this: Was their approach one? Uh, were they objective? Were they trying to verify or even blow this out of the water and maybe uh, refute or discount it? Were they, were they playing both sides here? How were they approaching it? Oh, they were approaching it scientifically. They were playing both sides. Um, you know, her side so that she would trust them. Right. But at the same time, uh, they were attempting to refute it. They were attempting to find scientific evidence that this was real. And they went on for a while where uh, they did not believe it until they finally did receive verifiable evidence. And it was it's all in the book and all about the U.S. government's interest in this too. And you hear about Dwight Eisenhower meeting with these entities. I still wonder if he met them out there in California as a result of her messages. She was able to train uh, a military man to communicate with these entities as well. And he, I know, was going to California on some kind of uh, research study or something. Was it was it at Edwards Air Force Base? I don't have that information. Right. So that's why it's speculative. I don't know. Right. For, well, it, it, it always seems the seemed, time frame. Right. The right. time frame is the same. You know, and and back then all roads lead to Edwards, right? You know, it just seems you know with uh, Eisenhower too as well. Um, with um, with all of these agencies now in involved uh, with Francis and and what was stated in these in these pages, um, how did they treat it? Was this immediately classified? Were they, you know what I mean? And were they communicating with each other? I have the FBI files. I show them uh, when I lecture. I didn't put them in the book. But um, I have the FBI files proving that this was going on. But the FBI files say that when they realized that her method of of uh, communication was not uh, typical and, and uh, acceptable to them, they went home. Well, I also have information that they really maintained a secret interest in this uh, as well and uh, continued to, of course, uh, attempt to communicate with these entities, attempt to have craft shown uh, at a uh, CIA office, and uh, on and on. There were there were many experiments that were done undercover. Now, when we um, when we look at where we are today, and I'm talking about you know Marco Rubio and the Senate and the UAP task force report and this new group that has been put together and, and so forth, where we are today, it sounds like through Francis Swan and this packet that this has been going on the whole time, that this interest in this and they, they know that these craft are real. Um, we can say UFO, UAP, flying saucers, whatever, but this is, this is a reality that, that has existed the entire time through the Department of Defense in Washington, D.C.? 
I believe so. I was absolutely shocked to learn that this was going on in 1954. I knew about the government study. Stanton and I did a great deal of research on that. Right. And of course, he had before me, we wrote fact fiction and flying saucers about all of that. But um, to have that information um, and, and at that time being so skeptical myself about it, uh, uh, made me wonder what why would the government become involved in something as crazy as this telepathic communication um, attempting to communicate um, maybe through channeling or automatic writing and that sort of thing mm -hmm. and uh, you know so that's why I put it away for uh, many years and and sort of had a dismissive attitude toward it until I learned more and I began to change my mind to, and I read that information. And so I started wondering if other experiencers had been given information as well. I know that I was given information that I never spoke of because I wasn't going to speak without having confirmation that other people had received that. And what do you do? What, this is what I find so interesting, Kathleen. What do you do when you start co connecting the dots yourself, right? You've got your other experiencers that you're talking to. You're sitting on this paperwork. You're starting to understand. But things that only you know you haven't shared and That's suddenly right. it's starting to uh, show up in front of you from different sources. Uh, what do you do with that uh, inside of yourself? Is it vindication? Are you relieved or does it scare the crap out of you? It didn't scare the crap out of me at all. It, it um, may, gave me a much better understanding of what is going on, what this is all about. And, uh, I was, you know, even though I was sitting on it, I was I was uh, working on three major studies for commonalities that experiencers share, and they had open-ended questions. Uh, did you receive any messages from these ETs? Did they communicate with you at all? If so, what did you learn? And we learned a great deal in those studies, and the messages were the same as Francis Swan was giving back in 1954. And then I had the opportunity to meet a man in Florida. Um, and I was at the MUFON Symposium. It was in 2000 and, no, oh, I think it was 2016 in Orlando. And he had gone there because the ETs had told him to go to that conference he said he had to pay a lot of money in order to do what they told him to do. But he had been communicating, he said, with them since he was eight years old. And now he, here he was. He had been uh, uh, in the, a police officer in England. That's where he was from. He had moved to the United States. He was a real estate agent. He happened to live in the same town that I live in. But we didn't know one another. That's pretty strange to to find this out. His wife had uh, worked in the psychology department at the university. She was a researcher. She had a an important position. Very a grounded, very left-brained woman. Nice woman. And uh, he said to us, he he met us for for lunch. Uh, Two of my friends and myself, one is Dr. Melanie Barton Bragg, the other is Denise Stoner. And he said, uh, would you like to meet with me and the council? And we thought about it. I, it was sort of intriguing, especially because of what uh, Admiral Knowles and Wilbert Smith did. And, and I knew about the government involvement at that time. And I thought, well, you know, he could be delusional. He could be mentally ill. He could be hoaxing this. I don't know what he is. But let's see if we can 
uh, meet with him and and kind of uh, get an opinion on whether this is for real. And we met with him one weekend every month for a period of two years. We expanded the group over time. We were allowed to ask questions. We brought in our scientific equipment. We uh, uh, had we acquired scientific evidence to show that this was real, and we learned to communicate telepathically with one of these entities. And uh, so that is what the rest of the book is about. Tw 120 questions that we asked this council of alleged ETs and what the answers were. Okay. Now, this is where I am going to say we're not going to end this show now. I need to keep you for another 20 minutes. <laughs> and we are going to... I. The audience uh, would absolutely uh, uh, be angry with the two of us if we just said good night. So can I keep you for another 20 minutes after this yes, break? Yes, you can keep me a little while longer. <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> Kathleen Martin is with us. We're going to take a quick break. The new book is out. It is called Forbidden Knowledge. Got all the links up right there on social media, over on our website, in the video description box below. It is an amazing read. More with Kathleen after this short break. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. Listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter, but listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Jimmy Church. Jason Martell's book, Knowledge Apocalypse, 10-Year Anniversary Edition, is now available. Most ancient cultures speak of a time when their gods visited them. They never say their gods came from across the ocean or from the mountains. They always came down from the skies. Was ancient man visited by gods or extraterrestrials? We have not been told the full truth about our human past. There was a time when all the ancient cultures lived amongst beings they considered their gods. The search for truth leads us down the path of learning where the ETs might come from and why they are here. To understand some of these advanced topics and learn the truth about human origins, buy the new book from Jason Martell, Knowledge Apocalypse. Now in its 10-year anniversary edition available on Amazon.com by clicking on the banners over on our site or simply visit JasonMartell.com. That's JasonMartell.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. 
The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one-year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Kathleen Martin is with us. And on that cliffhanger, <laughs> right before the break. And uh, uh, here's the thing. When we get to overtime and 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 we're blessed with this moment, uh, Kathleen, I like to usually uh, just loosen things up a little bit and have a little bit of fun. Uh, but when you say uh, two years hanging out with the council, uh, we got to stop right there. We got to bump the brakes and just say, "What? What? What? <laughs> what?" Now, um, uh, before before we move forward with this, and again, it's the second half of the book, um, everybody. So there's a lot there. Um, uh, but is this? Is, everybody's asking the same question. Is this the Council of Nine? Is this what was, uh, you know, through all the mediumship uh, that happened in the past? Is this that council or something? Are we talking about something completely different? They call themselves the Council of Eight. Right. Uh, there are two very tall human-looking members of the council. They appeared to Kevin. Briggs the first time when he was an eight-year-old boy in the bathtub and they suddenly materialized in the bathroom and uh, the man who he calls Ort uh, came back a year later as an orb and was behind his curtain for a week but came out and taught him how to astral travel and uh, there's a lot more in the book but uh, Getting back to what we did with Kevin, um, there's Ort, there's D, who is his female partner, the, the tall humans, um, Orla, who is a tall white, Arna, who is a blue avian, Chica, who is um, a, a, a mantis type, we have with a big smile, he, he's a very jolly fellow. Um, then there is um, a, a tall, very tall gray Targ. And then there is a shorter gray Zark. And he is the one that I interacted with during this time. And he 
actually came to me in my office. I couldn't see him, but I could feel the very strong electrical energy coming from his presence Mm -hmm. and could communicate telepathically. I learned to do that. Um, Don't ask me to do it now because I am out of practice, but uh, it was pretty amazing. And then they are here, they said, uh, to overlook this quadrant of our galaxy. And there is the lead council, and the lead council is a ninth dimensional entity, which means that he no longer has a body. The others are fifth and sixth dimensionals. The ninth dimensional overseer um, said that he, the last time he lived here on earth was in, in Egypt. And his name is Ra, by the way, but he says that he's not the sun god. Ra. Okay. Okay. Now uh, let's let's back up. Let's go to uh, the first uh, session. Uh, I'm just going to uh-huh. call it session. You know, you guys get together for the first time. You really you've been told what uh, you can possibly expect, but what were you thinking um, at the time? Were you like, oh, come on? Or, yes. <laughs> right. Yes, I was. Oh, come on. I was. I was very apprehensive about even taking part in this experiment. Right. And, uh, but I thought, oh, well, I'll just do this secretly. I'll never tell anybody about it because if I do, it's going to destroy my reputation. That's a good way to scientific. That's a good yes. approach. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I, uh, Denise and I talked about it, Denise Stoner, and we thought, well, we're going to take equipment and we'll set up equipment uh, to see if we there are any changes. And so I don't know if it was the first session or the second session, but we were introduced to the Council of Eight, to each member. And each member, although we couldn't see them, spoke to us. And when they came in, one at a time, the temperature in that part of the room where they were standing increased by about five degrees. We had a laser thermometer to measure that. Now, when Ra finally came with his big booming voice through Kevin, the temperature went up eight, more than eight degrees. Just incredible. And And, and we felt this intense tingling sensation through our bodies. Everyone in the room felt that. Now, at what point, uh, I'm going to, there's a lot of questions, uh, that, that are in the book. Um, we'll, we'll get to maybe one or two of those and, uh, before the end of the show, but at what, at what point do you turn the page in this where you go from, Oh, come on to Holy crap. Oh, it's, it's, it was sort of up and down because the first thing that they wanted to do is to show us a craft and to come and speak with us. And I was third in line for that. Melanie saw the craft, so a big light in the sky. Um, it, it communicated with her. Um, Denise saw a light in the sky, but she wasn't entirely certain. Hers wasn't as successful. And so they went out at night. I didn't want to stay up late at night. So I said, well, I like to get up early in the morning. Come to me at 5 a.m. And so I was sitting out in the dark on my deck, looking over the lake. I wanted them to come in and show me the craft over the lake. And suddenly, I felt Zark's presence, that very strong electrical tingling through my body. And so I knew he was there and I looked out on the lake and there was a big whirling circle of water. And I was waiting for a craft to rise up out of the lake and it didn't. (laughs) And then I thought, is it cloaked? 
is it invisible, but it's causing the water to whirl? And I didn't know the answer to that question. And so I, I ended up going to Kevin and I said, Kevin, the next time, because he can talk to Zark anytime, I said, ask Zark if it was a craft that was doing this. And uh, they and they said, no, it was not their craft. It was Zark. Zark said it was probably his energy. He has a tremendous amount of energy. And it was the energy over the lake that was causing his energy, causing that. When uh, this communication, because you're saying booming voice and 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 uh, you know this communication is is now happening, when you say that, was this all telepathic, or was it through um, somebody else at at the session? Uh, when we were with Kevin, it was through Kevin, right? But. When I was sitting in my office and they came, it was Kevin wasn't here. Mm -hmm. It was me, and it was Zark who wanted to communicate with me, and I was I was very frightened because I've talked to people about uh, negative entities, lower vibrating entities. How did I know that this wasn't a demon? Right. For example, how uh, would I let this? get close to me and i was always uh, extraordinarily apprehensive about this and and you know a little frightened of it as well so i i became less frightened as uh, time passed you know now this was going on starting in 2016 and we still meet two to three times a year uh, to talk with the council as well so you know, I I grew more comfortable as time passed, and I learned more about it. Now, uh, what what kind of homework do you do? You know, compiling questions and and you know this exciting opportunity to to not only ask questions but hopefully get some answers. Uh, what kind of questions were you putting together? Well, initially, there were all of those questions about why, for how long. Um, what are your main concerns with us? Who are you? Are you really extraterrestrials? I really uh, probably went a little overboard on that, just pounding at that question, mm -hmm. because they'd always say, well, extraterrestrials to you, but not to ourselves. So I was going, well, what do they mean? Are they playful human ent um, spirits who are doing this? Are these uh, some kind of interdimensionals who live here, or are or are they truly extraterrestrials? And you know, so it was always a lot of questions uh, initially, uh, but then we narrowed those questions down as time went on, and asked some very specific questions. Were you getting uh, direct answers? Yes. You weren't getting, you know, well, you know, to, you, to go up, you must first go down. You know, you know, those not, kind, you, not those kind of answers. We were getting direct answers. Okay. Um, yes. So give me an example of, uh, of, uh, of a direct question on point and a direct answer. Okay. Why are you here? Yeah, that's what a direct do you want, Yeah. What do you want? <laughs> with us on this planet and they said the same thing they told francis swan that had never been published we're here to guide you and assist in your development we've been here for a very long time and we come back from time to time to assist in your development well, why do you want to assist in our development? What are you doing? And, you know, well, this got into the questions about hybrids and, and that sort of thing as well. Sure. Well, this reproductive program, but I'm, um, that's all in the book. But um, just why? What, why are you so interested in us? And, and the answer was because you're in a position where – Right now, in your point in history where you can destroy yourselves, you've done it before, 
and we're not going to let it happen this time. That's why. And uh, did you ask him about uh, Betty and Barney? I asked about why I was taken. And? And why why it was uh, they took us along this, these genetic lines? Did they know about Did they know about you? Um, I don't think that they actually knew about me. It right. didn't seem that way when I was first introduced. They just Zark wanted to meet with me because he he said I had a keen scientific mind, and he's a scientist. He gave me some very interesting information that's in the book. And, but also, and, oh, uh, no, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I, I'm not going to interrupt Kathleen Martin. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. So um, they are also very involved in, in our environmental destruction. They want to move us ahead on an evolutionary scale. And the reason that they take people along generational lines is so that they can observe the changes generationally in the same gene pool. The, um, uh, the, description, uh, the descriptions you gave of, of them individually um, is this, how, how did you see them? How did, or, or is this a description of them that they gave to you? I saw some of them in my mind's eye, but not physical in front of me. That was one thing that was really disappointing. Right. I wanted to see them physically. Sure. They told me when I and, and the rest of us, when we elevated our vibrational frequency to the point where ours was much closer to theirs, then we would be able to see them. But uh, they, they were not ready to show themselves to us, although they showed us craft. And, um, you know, so still... I have questions, and I don't have the answers, but uh, I, th I felt that what I learned is so significant. I know scientifically that something was occurring. Something was happening. It was measurable. It was repeatable. And we had uh, a, a couple of skeptics on the team later on as well. So you'll read all about that and their questions and, and uh, what they experienced. In did, the book. Did, did you say to them, I'm 58. Okay. Now mm -hmm. I'm not old. I'm not young, but I am 58. Okay. So I'm on the other side of being young, but uh, my, I would, my thing would be, look, I, I don't have the time to raise my vibration. <laughs> Right. I, I need to see you now. Yeah. And did you express that point of oh, view to absolutely. them? Absolutely. We did. And, and uh, Melanie, in fact, became pretty frustrated and angry over the fact that we were not seeing them, that they weren't materializing in front of us. We could see orbs. We could not see them. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, why? Why wouldn't they do this? And, and they said, well, perhaps we will, but not now. So they made us become very patient. Now, this started, this started in 2016. And I do remember you telling me about you sitting in your office and, and, and the contact that you had made then. Uh, 2017 rolls by. We now know about uh, the Tic Tac and the Nimitz and the Roosevelt incidents. Um, and you are having these sessions with the Council of Eight, were you able to ask them about the Tic Tac and if that was them? Um, they said that they and others were showing their craft to us. Um, they said that there were others who uh, were not as conservative, you might say, as, as they are, who didn't have our... Uh, the kind of interest in mind that they have in us um, who were, were showing the, their craft much more frequently. Right, right. Is, uh, is the Council of Eight 
um, also communicating with our government and other governments? They're trying to. Uh, Kevin has taken this to the United Nations mm -hmm. and uh, asked for a meeting, and he was ignored. They're trying, th trying to put something together with the United Nations. Do because it's not just this council. There are people all over the world who are talking with ETs and councils of ETs now. Now, where is, uh, where is the council? Do you, do you know where they are? Re remember, you know, we can go back to Betty's star map, right? Or uh, these conversations about Orion or other star constellations out there. Um, we know that there are exoplanets throughout the Milky Way and throughout the universe, right? Every star has got a planet or multiple planets around them. Um, is the council close to Earth? Are, are they in a craft in orbit around our planet? Or are they communicating from something more distant? And do you know where that location is? They are pretty much in our solar system. Ooh. Uh, some of them no longer have planets that they live on. They're just in very large craft. And uh, some of them do go back to planets from time to time. Um, but, yeah, they're, they say they're in our solar system. Is there, um, again, I always go back to the word coincidence, right? Um, where we are right now with disclosure, and that goes across the scientific community, the media, Washington, D.C., our own community, we know that things are moving forward, but it is also pretty remarkable that you're having these sessions with the council during this time. Is everything connected? I wouldn't doubt that it's connected. Uh, you know, all of this, I think, is uh, in part being brought forth because there are so many people around the world who know that this is real. They've seen the craft close up. They've uh, been on the craft. They've communicated with the non-humans on the craft. And uh, there was going to come a tipping point when more than half the world would know from the experiencers themselves mm -hmm. that this was real. And the council said that they had gone to the heads of state in other countries. They had tried to work this out and that no one was interested in any assistance from them. Is uh, And last question, and I, I want to say, uh, Kathleen, you're wonderful. This has been an amazing conversation tonight. And, and I want to thank you uh, not only for tonight, but uh, going into overtime and doing this. But I wanted to ask you this. Um, in your life's journey, um, were you spiritual in the past? And, and this isn't a yes or no question, but if you were or weren't, how has it changed you today? And are you more spiritual now than you were in the past? In the past, I was religious as opposed to spiritual, and I was uh, just left-brained, scientific. That's what I wanted to be. Right. I wasn't able to communicate with them at will until I got over into my right brain. And when I did, I became much more spiritual very spiritual, uh, developed abilities that I'd never had. Incredible. Incredible. The book is amazing. And uh, I know that when you set off uh, to, to write this, that the challenge was in front of you. But uh, uh, you got it done, young lady. It's an amazing book. And thank you for writing thank it. Thank you. And thank you, Jimmy, for having me on tonight. <laughs> You're the best. And again, I'll say this, everybody. Kathleen glows. You glow. Now, enjoy the rest of your night, and uh, we'll circle back and talk soon. Thank you so much. Okay. Great to see you again. It's great to Good see night. you. Thank you, Kathleen.
Kathleen Martin, and we've got uh, the links up uh, for the book throughout social media in the video description box below and, of course, over on our website. I do want to remind everybody that tomorrow night uh, right here, Freddie Silva is with us, and we're going to be talking about our ancient far past and the possibility of ET contact and what is going on there. And that is tomorrow night. What an incredible conversation. Kathleen Martin. Thank you so much. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitolo, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2022 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, right here, Freddie Silva. Until then, I want everybody to be safe. It's time to fade to black. Black.